What's up, Accelerators? Welcome to Normalize It, the show where we speak about and explore the business of disability inclusion and accessibility. I'm your host, Cam Baudouin, and on each episode, I'll be interviewing leaders, professionals, and people with lived experiences. And we'll be discussing the challenges, successes, and strategies on how to make this world a more inclusive place. As you know, many organizations are still trying to figure out disability inclusion through a trial and error method. That's inefficient. Stick around to the end of the show to find out how we can fix that. So whether you're an advocate, entrepreneur, business owner, stakeholder, VP, or just someone who's interested in the world of disability inclusion, this show is for you. Let's dive into it. Meryl, we're here to talk about uh, a lot of what you do today. We're here to talk about um, the business of accessibility. Uh, I want to start there. What's missing in the business conversation around accessibility, in your opinion? Where to start? Right. Okay, I'll cover two things. First, accessibility for the company-owned employees. Companies are so focused on their clients and customers that they forget their own employees need accessibility. And that to see every organization to ask every single employee what accessibility they require to create the best work environment for them. Second, they also forget about non-digital accessibility. Digital accessibility isn't siloed. Many companies have processes that involve non-digital and digital accessibility. For example, you can schedule a flu shot online Mm-hmm. And then you get the flu shot in person. Both parts need to be accessible. That's what I call 360 degree accessibility. Yeah, I really like that. 360 degree accessibility. I- I've never heard of that before, actually, but that's a great way to put it all into perspective. You know, we need to think of everything and and it's intimidating. I'm going to admit, you know, when I put on my, I take off my accessibility hat and I put on my uh, business lead hat, and it's not an excuse, but man, it can get to be a lot. But the goal should be to get to that point where 360 accessibility is the only way to, to go forward, right? Yes. And I just happened to publish the post on that topic today. When you say 360 accessibility, and like why so why is that so important? Because I know that there's people out there who are again business owners or people who say that yes, I I only have budget or time to care about the actual digital accessibility. And I don't have time to care about my employees or maybe something along those lines. What do you say to those people? I mean, why is that? Why is that important? Accessibility is for everyone. I talk about curb cut accessibility in almost every presentation I give. That's because it's the one thing that resonates with people. It clicks. Not everyone knows what curb cuts are. Short version the ramps at three corners. Mm-hmm. They allow wheelchairs to cross the three safely. It's no fun to go down a step when you have wheels. Mm-hmm. And not you like doing that seriously though. Everyone uses the ramp. Yeah. People will throw them. Shoppers pushing carts, travelers pulling nuggets, and workers hauling heavy loads. Mm-hmm. Think about what life would be like without ramp. Do you really want to push a stroller with a baby down the step? Doing that takes more time as when I did it, I turn around with my back to the street and slowly and carefully move the stroller down the step. This isn't completely safe because my back is to the street. Right. Accessibility has the curb cut effect. Yep. The best example of that is what's the best example of curb cut uh, accessibility? Uh, 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 captions? Uh, 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 uh. Yes. We did captions. it. We did it. Hey, imagine that. <laughs> 80% of the people who use captions are yes. not deaf or hard of hearing. Yeah. Then those reverse accessibility, which is also been referred to as accidental. Accessibility. This yep. is not a product that wasn't made with accessibility in mind. It turns out it's a valuable accessibility tool. Right. Yeah. My Apple Watch is yep. an example of that. 
I really got to fit me. Now, I use the farm law as an accessibility tool. When my watch vibrates, I know without looking at it, it was a text message, yep. or a camera motion, a timer going off, or I need to make a right turn. You see, what I really love about that comparison with the curb cuts is that I know, and, and there's some really good podcasts on the curb cut effect. There's one called 99% Invisible, and they talk about that, uh, the whole curb cut effect. What was really interesting is I kind of thought about getting into the mind of the contractors who were building roads back, I think it was what, in the 50s or 60s when curbs started, like the curb cut started. And can you imagine they were probably saying the same things that we say now? It's too expensive. It's not worth it. What's the point? Who is it worth? And, you know, they just weren't seeing far enough ahead. But, but now it's it's standard. You know, it's it's become a standard. It's become normalized to just on any street corner, you put the curb down no matter what. If you are hearing in your organization some objections, or if you're hearing complaints from your business leaders, just think 70 years ago, 60 years ago, the same arguments were being done by construction workers. I guarantee it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So now um, an, another thing that I, that I love, now we brought up captions already, and you talk about this a lot of how during the pandemic, everything changed for you in business. And I know we've kind of hinted at this already. How did that change? Like, what were some of the positives that came out of the pandemic for you? So I've been a remote worker in 2005. Nothing changed for me when the pandemic hit. It was business as usual. For 15 years, I led a lonely career as a self-employed digital marketer. It was lonely because mm -hmm. I worked in the home office. All my communication was by email. While I'm an introvert, I do enjoy being around people. Mm -hmm. The pandemic led, led to the rise of video calls. For me, it was another communication tool that made me feel left bad. However, I was used to it. So many technologies have come out that knock out the depth and other disabilities, a few months later, most major video platforms added automatic caption. That was the game changer. Yep. I started having weekly calls with the client. My calendar filled with so many meetings, it surprised me that my calendar didn't crash after having hardly any meeting for 15 years. Well, mostly PTA meeting. <laughs> Captain video calls meant being invited to speak at many conferences in company. Yeah. Eventually, when the pandemic slowed down, I spoke at in-person events, which is how we met at ActUSU. Yep. And TEDx would have never happened without the pandemic. Meeting some of the incredible accessibility leaders would have never happened without the pandemic. Right before the pandemic, I was working on pivoting my career as a digital marketer to accessibility marketing. Mm. The pandemic fueled that. And, and you know, turning that into such a, a, a good story long term, I've actually now met quite a few people who had disabilities who've now all this other technology, which again, wasn't specifically designed. You know, Zoom was not designed for people with disabilities. It was not. And I remember Zoom and I'm sure other services as well. Remember when you had to pay for, for captions? Remember when that yes. was, was a thing, yeah. right? And that was, that was terrible. First off, that was terrible. Please don't do that. If you're a business owner, these, this should be provided for free and you should look into your best uh, integrations to be able to provide the best captions you can. Accessibility should never cost extra. Absolutely. Right, right, right. One of my friends now, so he was saying how um, because of the pandemic, he could then all of a sudden study from home, which is one thing he wanted to do for his entire education. And it was so useful to him to be able to, to study and work from home. It convenience. He didn't have to navigate the, uh, he didn't have to navigate outside of this house. It was allowing him to study the way he wanted to uh, all long term, which is really great. And he finished school. It was it was fantastic. Yeah, thankfully, my son, my youngest, was really good about studying. He's a very motivated student. Yeah, and he spent his last year of high school on the second floor of our home office. Yeah, yeah, school building. And the pandemic also helped me personally. It normalized caption video calls. Absolutely, yeah. When he went off to Purdue University, follow up, y'all, 
I thought I would never hear from that boy again until he came home, other than for laundry advice. In fact, the first photo I got from him yep. when I was in college for months was a picture of a washing machine. <laughs> he wanted to make sure he was using the right button because it was yeah. different from home. Anyway, so one day, so he was, he was on video calls to school. He saw me on video calls for work. So one day, I got a text message from him. It's a dream for a deaf parent. And it was that he asked me if I wanted to get on a caption video call. Yeah. That would have never happened without the pandemic. Yeah. Yep. Normalized it for him. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I like to to bring up a lot of the fact of sometimes organizations find it really hard just to get started with accessibility. We've talked a lot about like simple things like captions. Is that where you lead from when you talk about accessibility? Do you start there? Because that's a really easy place to start, you know? Well, well no, I don't start with captions. I mean, it might come up. It just, every scenario is different. It just depends on why I'm talking to someone and what the topic is. But um, and the biggest problem is the lack of education and yep. awareness. Yeah. Companies don't feel overwhelmed. Well, of course they do. Mm-hmm. We all feel what we don't know and understand. That's why I post every day sharing my experiences and my learning, what I learned from so many other wonderful people. Mm-hmm. So accessibility needs to be incorporated into the company culture it's because it's not just the web development or IT job. So it's everyone's job. Human resources need to ensure the hiring and onboarding process is accessible. Yep. Marketing needs to ensure is public facing content is accessible. Procurement need to ensure the product it brings into yep. the company is accessible. The list is long, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I preach progress over perfection. Don't wait until you get all the pieces in place to start. Just take that first step. And a powerful first step is to assign an, an executive champion yes. who is passionate about accessibility. Yeah. And they should have a backup because if the champion leaves the company, the company would go back to square one. Right. right. No one takes over. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's that so, institutional knowledge which leaves as soon as one person uh, quits the company or leaves. Definitely. So once you get that in place, the next step is to ensure our employees get training on accessibility and disability awareness. Mm-hmm. Now, and our new employees should get that as well. And I'm not saying this because I do training. I'd rather company hire someone else to do the training than not do it yep. at all. That's yep. how important it is. And if you don't have an executive champion, yeah, it's okay. People can start within our teams or departments, yep. create processes and checklists that include accessibility. For example, marketing could start by describing all of its images and captioning all of its videos. That's small. That's a, yep. that's yep. a great yep. first step. And if they have a process for creating videos, they'll want to add caption to that process. Yep. And see, what I really like about this conversation is we're talking about a culture shift. That's really what we're talking about here. This should fit in DEI, diversity, equity, and, inc- and inclusion forums. And this is how the conversation should be moving forward. I think great examples of champions, roles that already exist, that if you, if you maybe your organization doesn't have the funding or the budget or the roadmap to hire a chief accessibility officer. Uh, Great roles who normally fit into that are um, head of people departments, right? Chief people officers. Those are really good, uh, good place to start if someone needs to be nominated for that. I've also seen very successfully chief technology officers, CTOs work very well. I would probably move away from it being the, the uh, CEO's responsibility, but they should at least make sure the mandate is that we are releasing everything. All of our content, all of our responsibility is to make sure that it's accessible. One thing I, I want to add to that as well is uh, it, it's really funny because once you start to make the shift, it's really hard to go back. And that's a good thing, right? I, I don't hear too many companies say, oh, I can't wait to undiversify my workforce. Like no one is saying that. No one is no. saying, oh, you know, I, I want a less diverse workforce. That makes us work. No one is saying that. Once the action starts to happen, you'll realize how much better your organization is for making those changes. How did you even start that term auto Because that is now your 
your term. I mean, I never want to take credit for anything if it's not mine. You know, for example, I know someone else came up with caption, but not me. But I noticed when we started having automatic caption, I put together auto caption on my own, but I keep it the only one. So who knows? It's that not important. The important point is what the, the message that communicates. Yeah. Yeah. And see, you know what? I'm just going to shout out right now. Like, look at the shirts that we're wearing right now, right? I even wore my Progress Over Perfection shirt here. I think you can buy that off Merrill's store. We really start to have this conversation, this idea of progress over perfection on a conversation about Peloton. And I was sending um, videos. I, I think I sent you a, a picture or I put a picture on my post that said Peloton now has captions. I didn't know they had captions before. You were using them for a while. I know you're a big avid Peloton user, but the most interesting part of that came around the idea of feedback and how do we give feedback to organizations who are not doing it properly? And I know there seems to be an idea of let's shame and blame the organization. Uh, that's not the way that I like to, to, to go forward with it. Meryl, why don't you give your way of giving feedback to an organization? I'll give mine and maybe we can teach people uh, as, as a result of that. And that's a little track with that note here. You kind of jump style coming in off guard. So <laughs> it depends on the situation. So people um, sometimes share a link with me to show me a video with bad caption. Well, therefore, they could be accurate, but the readability might be the problem. I won't get feedback on the caption unless I Unless asked, yeah. But I made one exception, but it was hard. I wrote a blog post about the caption on Stranger Things. They were getting raved. I mean, people were doing memes about with captions from Stranger Things, and they were funny, and they were cool, and I enjoyed that show myself. I'm, yep. late, I'm late to the party, but I'm here for it. I was getting worried because there was so much complimenting, but they also have some issues. And the biggest one I never thought would ever happen. So captioning is hard work, right? So they over caption the sound. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, I mean, there's one thing where there's a sound here, a sound here, a sound here, like we sound in a matter of seconds, and it was ridiculous. It was noticeable and tiring. I felt like I was watching the caption the whole time. Right. I didn't feel like I was watching the show. Right, the right. The caption show, and that's not how it should be. So when I wrote that post, I opened that saying, this is an excellent case study, because they clearly care about high-quality captions, yeah. and then this is the thing they did well. And I pointed out what needed improvement because I don't want season five to be a repeat of season four. I want to watch the show. Right. Uh, when social media companies added automatic caption, people started complaining right away. How can we, what about editing the caption? So I'm like, hold up a minute. At least they've added caption. That's a great starting point. If they have waited until they made editing caption, possible, we mm -hmm. might be in for a long wait. I want to have imperfect captions sooner than perfect captions later. And that's exactly what Apple did with the iOS 16. They, it's the first time they added that caption, right? Yeah. You were just talking about that. But if you go to the setting, it actually stays better in the setting. And I really appreciate it that Apple released the live caption now even though they need a lot of work, yep. it allows them to get feedback. And right. I encourage all of you to share feedback with Apple yep. about the live caption and any other accessibility. Feedback does and can pay off. And one time I want to um, share an example that I paid off. So I went into a chat with online support. It was a tech chat. And the first thing they asked me was, can you give us the callback phone number in case we get disconnected? My favorite statement to get, right? Yep, yep. Uh, that didn't go over very well. So I told them, uh, I submitted a request to please give an option for a callback, like email. The next time I contacted them, they asked me for an email and phone number. Ah, uh, perfect. It's a little yep. thing. Yep. 
Yeah. Yeah. I'm seeing some comments here. Kristen is saying, you know, we need to publicly comment when they get it right as well, right? That positive reinforcement. When somebody does something right, it's great to encourage. I have a similar story about um, a, uh, a calendar picking app. So when someone wants to book some time with me, they just use my, my calendar link. This company, the calendar itself wasn't working well for a screen reader. I just said, let me just check this out with the screen reader just to see what happens. And sure enough, the calendar would go off screen. And so a screen reader user was kind of locked in this infinite calendar behind the scenes because it was it, you could just continue, continuously cycle through it. I gave them feedback. I even gave a little suggestion on how to fix it. Within two weeks, three weeks, it was fixed right away. And it was so good. It was so good. I did a post about it and I, I celebrated them uh, publicly for that as well. And it's so important. And I can appreciate the frustration that, that people have with companies that don't listen. So I want to talk about that too. If you are encountering a company that doesn't listen and you've already procured them, I would always recommend look for an accessibility statement before you procure the company. I do it all the time. I have it with my course. I, I made sure that the company has uh, an accessibility statement. Uh, the calendar, I already said that one. Um, there needs to be a positive feedback loop and we need to encourage and help support organizations that do have accessibility statements. Even, even if you have a, a WordPress website, there are form builders out there and the form builder companies have accessibility statements as well. Go search those out. Go search those out and you will find that they will have, uh, uh, they'll just have better feedback support for accessibility as well, if that matters to you in your organization. I remember there's this one situation with Peloton. Oh, no, I was going to talk about equal access because equal access is also something I like to keep in mind. Back to your comment about too many sounds that were typed out in the captions. Whenever I get stuck of like, you know, how much accessibility should I do? Should, am I going too far? Am I giving too much detail, too much description? And this is for people who use screen readers or use other assistive technology. I like to keep in mind when in doubt, equivalent access. What's equivalent access? I can give another example with alternative text. I want you to imagine if you had a graph, right? Like a chart, like a bar chart. If that bar chart is only supposed to communicate you know, a moving average of, I don't know, coffee cups that I drink per day, something like that, right? It could be something simple. If I'm just trying to, to, to communicate that I'm reducing my coffee intake, then that's all the information I need to, to, to uh, put in the alt text. I don't need to talk about the highs and the lows and the trend line and how many days are in there because that's not the information I'm trying to communicate. You can add all that information in somewhere else separately equivalent access. I'm trying to communicate my coffee consumption. I'm giving information on the coffee consumption. No more, no less. I agree. I agree. I always say be descriptive, yet concise. Uh, it, it's simply asking yourself, what do you want to know about this image in context with the article? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's the same thing with stuff description. Uh, not all people like stuff description. Right. I'm talking about the people in, that matter most, of course, and that people who are blind. Yep. So I've just learned to keep men sure and mention something that's not obvious about me as a compromise because I have met some who do like a, a, a visual description. So it's something that we call Schrodinger's A level my cat or alley cat because one, something that makes something accessible will break it for someone else. Right. So there is no such thing as perfect accessibility. As long as you put something into the image description that describes something, that's a great start. Right. But don't use it for search engine optimization, <laughs> as I know. One person who put all these keywords that have nothing to do with the picture. Yeah. And that is really, I, I tried to educate that person, but they opted not to listen. So I moved on. It happens. Do you know where I find that happens a lot, unfortunately, as well, is in stock image photography. Be careful if you're just pulling the alt text from the stock image because uh, the alt text in there will normally include too much information or information on the image, which you shouldn't be talking about. It happened recently where I was helping someone out with their website and they were putting the race, the gender, the color of their skin, the surroundings, and they added all of that into the alt text. Normally that, that type of information is irrelevant 
right? Unless it's it's necessary to communicate something, right? But this was this image was talking about a Sri Lankan woman in her forties uh, with uh, with a prosthetic leg walking down a hallway, and it was too much information, irrelevant to the story. And we were talking about it was it was like a banking app, like it had nothing, like neither of them had anything to do. So be careful, be careful about those keywords that come from other sources as well. I want to talk about you and your business. I want to talk about what service that you offer and what you can do here because you are um, a speaker. I want to start a speaker because you and I have talked a lot about speaking professionally. I want to hear more about what you speak about. And I want to hear more about how people get in contact with you for that. I talk about accessibility and disability awareness, high, high quality caption, how to create accessible website and social media content because that's the marketing person in me how to do things like conduct accessible meetings and events because I've had the pleasure of speaking out to event planners so, and other audiences about accessible meetings, both online, in person, and hybrid, because we do that with a level one New York. Yep. We were a hybrid event before the pandemic. Before. Yep. So it was so easy to, when the pandemic hit, it was so easy to go online because we already had that process in place. So that's another kind of an example of CurbCut, how it was able to adapt right. easily, right? So, um, and people can find me easily right here on LinkedIn and on Meryl.net, my website of many, many years. Meryl.net. And I mean, you seem friendly enough. Are people allowed to reach out to you and say hello on LinkedIn? I mean, you seem friendly enough to be able to be. As long as the last time is something. <laughs> oh my goodness, it's great. Oh, today I got a new one. Somebody saying she wanted to start weight loss and muscle building. I'm like, so are you calling me back? Are you calling <laughs> me out of shape? That's a really good way to start off our relationship by insulting me right. or my website. You know, I get those emails. If those engine could be better, your website could be better. I'm like, well, you just insult me. Do you think I want to hire you? Right, right, right. Exactly. Let, let's find all your, let's find all the things I don't like about you for, and then we'll all start the conversation off. Poor way to start for sales, by the way. Please don't start like that. Have, make 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 friends first before you try and sell me something, right? What else does uh, Barrel.net and what else do you offer as a service? Uh, well, I do three things. One is the speaking and training yep. I already mentioned. And the second thing is accessibility consultant. I have reviewed client products and given them feedback on the experience and accessibility. And another screen reader accessibility. I never give feedback on that. Unless I notice something in the content that I know will make the screen reader unhappy. Then I do research projects in which we get feedback from people with disabilities on the client product. We put together a report for the client so they will improve their product and so yeah. Then the third thing is accessibility marketing, because that's where I got started with marketing. Yeah. And so I work with marketing and communication team to educate them on how to create accessible marketing. Yeah. Great, great. Christine Lake Lakehind. She had that dealing with tech companies. She had to tell them that she couldn't take phone calls. How about text or email? And that's back to your point of when uh, when you're offering feedback through a chat. I actually have your, one of your posts as part of a regular conversation that I have, uh, or whenever I go and do speaking, where it is that phone number field when you fill out uh, when you fill out a form. You know, for somebody who can't hear, or at that moment or permanently that's a big barrier, right? I mean, if the only way I could put that in, yeah, I, I think you mentioned even in that post that you know people who don't even have a phone number associated with their phone, right? Right, exactly. Well, I actually read a story about a man who was deaf and he was looking for a job. And now we know how horrible the job searching process is hard. It, it, it does a lot to a person as is. Mm -hmm. And he has the extra barrier of being deaf. And he would get stressed out every time because of the phone number field. He did not have a phone number. That's unusual because even I have a phone number, even though I won't pick up the phone to talk, but I have a phone number. But that he don't neither here or there. The point is they need to be offering option. And that's another thing I've been pushing is for always offering multiple communication and input options. Right. So like my experience with the drive through they I could not see inside because it was reflecting the glass. 
and she was on the speaker. Well, of course, I couldn't hear the speaker. And she was wearing a mask. So drivers need to find a way to have other options besides the default. Right. Talking. Yeah. And this comes back to something that you mentioned right at the very beginning of this call around employees as well. The entire hiring process is really critical to make sure is is fully accessible. I'm talking basic things like making sure it's simple, like simplification of the form. People don't want to self-disclose. You don't force them to, or things like um, allowing timeouts to like only affect you after 10 minutes or even longer if you can. There's a whole timeout area in the accessibility guidelines that can help guide you there. And so there's a whole aspect of even in that hiring process, if you want candidates who, if you're, or if you're open to candidates with disabilities, make sure that form is accessible. You can't rely and just say, well, we don't have any, any employees with disabilities. It's because they can't even apply to the job. I had, I had in a previous speaker, I've talked about that as well. So much in here that um, the hiring process is, is, is banana. There's so much to consider. That's why they so small. So I would start with your most important form and that's the application form. That's where I would start. Absolutely. So that's how I work with companies instead of trying to throw a long list of what to do, what to pick. You know, let's start with the three most important things and go from there. Yeah. Wasn't that a great episode? You probably have lots of new ideas swirling through your head right now. Now, how are you going to go and teach that to your boss, your team, or your clients? You need a strategy to move forward. Contact me today, hi at cambodwayne.com, and let's talk about how we can move this forward in your organization or individual practice. If you could right now, like and subscribe to this show, it really does help grow our reach to get more people involved and interested in disability inclusion and making the world a more inclusive place. And don't forget, you can also watch this show live on LinkedIn. Just find me there. It's every Friday at noon Eastern. See you next week.